Hello everyone. So, this was not requested, but this doctor was, Dr. Roy. <laughs> and I saw this video pop up, how Islam saved Western civilization. So I thought, I'm gonna cough. I thought first I'm gonna cough, then I'm gonna do the video. And they're going to come out in 15 minutes segments. So, we're doing it. It's this guy, Dr. Start, Roy. I actually want to start so by uh, admitting something, which is, so the title of this talk is How Islam Saved Western Civilization. <clears throat> For the record, I believe that that is a totally accurate statement. There's nothing, I didn't, this isn't an attempt to back away from that title at all. The thing I want to admit is the title of this talk is How Islam Saved Western Civilization. I have nested a contradiction in the title that I'm going to show you later on purpose because I like to do things like that. I, I, it's just my nature. So I just want you to know I'm admitting this right off the start. Um, so. To start this thing off, though, I also want to admit something else, which is that I picked the title because there's a book that kind of inspired me. But the book is deeply flawed. And the book is How the Irish Saved Civilization. I got the book, I, I want to say, like 22 years ago. And I, I hate doing this because I feel like it feels like I'm picking on somebody. But the book is deeply flawed. It's riddled with two contradictions, in fact. And I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because those are some of the contradictions I want to tease out in this talk. So here's the premise of the book. On September 4, 476 AD, the Roman Empire collapsed. It was a very sad day. There was much lamenting. And then <clears throat> the Irish saved civilization because the Irish had already converted to Christianity. And Christianity, of course, is the core of civilization and so the Irish went to Europe and converted those awful pagan Germanic tribesmen to Christianity and saved civilization in the process. <clears throat> That's wrong on multiple levels. The first and most obvious level is Rome didn't fall on September 4, 476 AD. So if the whole idea is that the Irish saved civilization from collapse, but it didn't collapse, then we're, the premise is already shot out of the water. We're already in trouble. Rome fell May 29, 1453. It's almost a thousand years later. This, is a, this isn't a small error. This is a gigantic error. So that's one problem. Another problem with the premise is the following. Most of the Germanic tribesmen were Christian. So if the Irish are converting them to Christianity, that's odd. <laughs> It's like when President William McKinley said, we're conquering the Philippines to make it Christian. And there, you know, like 80% of the Filipino population went, we're, we're Catholic. <clears throat> of course, what McKinley meant was to make them Protestant. But anyway, that's a different story. We're just going to genocide 800,000 of these folks and hopefully flip them over to Protestantism. Didn't work. Um, so this... The second contradiction that they were going to convert the Germanic tribesmen to Christianity is actually shockingly similar to the McKinley thing I just brought up. Not all of the Germanic tribesmen had converted. Some of them were still pagan. But the ones that, that had converted were the wrong kind of Christian. That's what he really means. In 325 AD, Emperor Constantine decided that Christianity was too unwieldy of a religion. It, it, was, it was too complicated, too mysterious. There were too many moving parts. And it needed to be toned down a little bit, in part to get rid of some of the contradictions. Like, for example, the Trinity. It was driving everybody nuts, right? How does this work? He's what? And, and so Constantine said, I want 318 of you theologians to go to Nicaea and figure out how to make Christianity into something a little bit more manageable, because if Rome, Rome had already majority, was already majority Christian at that point, if, if the Roman Empire is going to use Christianity as the state religion to manipulate people, 
We, we as the politician class need to be able to know what Christianity is. How can we manipulate people through religion if we don't understand the religion? So they get together at Nicaea. They, they, they come up with a solution for the Trinity. There were 30 gospels. They threw 26 away. They ordered them destroyed. It didn't quite work. Uh, we have the other 26. Um, most of them were found in Egypt by a, by a farmer who was in the desert digging up phosphorus and he hit a jar with his, with his shovel and he heard it crack and he pulled the jar out and he saw these leather bound books. I think, I want to say it was 46, 47. And he pulls out the leather bound books and he's like, I don't know what these are, but I know who will know. And he went to the, he was Muslim. He went to the nearby church the Coptic Orthodox Church, and he handed them to the priest, and the priest went, oh, I know what these are. These are the 26 Apocrypha. And the church then immediately declared it a miracle that somehow the 26 Apocrypha had survived. And the Coptic Church claims that all 30 Gospels are legit and rejects the rejection of the 26 Apocrypha. Apocrypha means wrong, right? So it rejects the wrong the declaration that they're wrong. <clears throat> At Nicaea, the 318 also had a conversation about one other problem. And the problem was how to understand Christ's nature on earth. If he was God, then how did he manage sin, for example? There was a guy named Arius of Alexandria. He was actually from Karanaika. Long story. He was living in Alexandria. That's where he made his career. <clears throat> uh, Arius of Alexandria went, here's my suggestion. Jesus was God, pure God, total God. As a result, he was never tempted. Done. No sin. But the majority said, no, that's wrong. Jesus was God. God in a man's body, the body was tempted. Therefore, he did experience what it would be like to be tempted, but because he was God, he overcame it and there was no sin. That became orthodox doctrine. The other part became heresy. It's known as the Arian heresy. Arian with an I, not a Y. I is Arius of of Alexandria, why is the, the horse people who conquered India to Ireland. Uh, so, um, that's the Aryan heresy. It took off in Egypt, it took off in Syria, and the Germanic tribesmen really liked it. So that's what's being converted. They're being taken away from the Aryan heresy into what we would, we would have considered mainstream Christianity. Of course, in the United States, the average American Christian is an Aryan heretic. I can prove it to you. There is a Greek guy who wrote a book called The Last Temptation of Christ. His name was Nikos Kazantzakis. The Last Temptation of Christ is Orthodox Christian belief. Christ was tempted as a man, but overcame it because he was God. Americans went nuts when Scorsese turned this into a movie. The French also went nuts. They actually set a historical... What was the movie? Goodfellas? Casino? Historical movie theater on fire while people were in it because they couldn't believe that a movie that could be this heretical could be made when the reality was they were the heretics. That was, that was the church's official belief. <laughs> I'm the only one that thinks that's hilarious. All right, fine. <laughs> These are the types of contradictions I want to tackle, <clears throat> right? This, the assumptions that we go into these conversations with, like, oh, the Germanic tribesmen are pagans, and oh, right? And, and the reality is, is it's way more complicated. So to do that, I want to start with a definition of Western civilization. I've covered this before in other lectures, but I have to treat every lecture like a standalone. So if you've heard me before, forgive me for any redundancy. I will try not to focus too much on this particular definition just because I've covered it in other lectures, but, but I still need to do this. So <clears throat> if you take a college level course, Intro to Western Civilization, and for the record, uh, I'm a political scientist, but 
Uh, history is obviously a thing of mine, and I did teach for a few years with the University of Maryland uh, University College, and I did teach their Intro to Western Civilization class. So I'm also te telling you this as a person, as a recovering uh, Intro to Civilization professor. Usually, every school is probably a little bit different because it depends on the textbook and the professor, but usually the class starts in 5,400 BC, sorry, 3,400 BC, or if you're like me and you reject BC because it's confusing, 5,400 years ago. And then um, the class usually goes, it depends again on the text and the professor, but it usually goes to 1648 with the end of the Thirty Years' War, which didn't end in 1648 and lasted about 50 years, just for the record, just, so, just to make things not work. And then Intro to Western Civ II usually starts in 1648 and goes to the present, which I've always thought was remarkable because it shows our bias for the con contemporary period because we're going to take 5,000 years of history, <coughs> 5,400 years ago, to 400 years ago, and we're going to compress that into 16 weeks, and then we're going to do three and a half centuries in, in 16 weeks. It seems like an unfair distribution. We're literally giving the recent centuries 17 times the attention that we gave the old centuries. But okay, set that aside for a moment. The, the only thing I could say to that, the reason why, and and I'm just I'm just guessing uh, is that we are more familiar with the recent you know 5,400 years ago it's a lot of I don't want to say guesswork but uh, there, there's not as much notes uh, uh, notes um, documented information that is readily available for people to research and look into they weren't thinking about it so much like we today things are documented but back then it's it's much tougher to find those things so it's not that you don't focus on it because you're not interested in it you tend to not focus on it as much because it it's harder to verify does that make sense I'm not saying that that's a reason why it should be ignored. It shouldn't be. And I think it would be fascinating to look at something that happened 5,000, 4,000 years ago. But we might start piecing, guessing. Uh, let me say that again. It might turn into piece work, uh, a piecemeal of these are things that we kind of know and then we might guess on how they kind of come together we just we just don't have as much solid information is what i'm trying to say i think and i don't know if i've said it does that make sense i mean we we kind of know what happened 100 years ago so that's and i'm not saying that and I'm, I'm not saying that to counter what he's saying. That's just my only guess as to why they wouldn't focus on it. And guess that most of civilization today being a... I don't want to say modern, but three, four hundred years ago is more modern to us and to how we are today. That's my best guess. Odds are good that your professor will start the, this class with maybe one, maybe two, but probably one lecture on Mesopotamia and Sumer and the, and the beginning of writing. And then maybe the second lecture will briefly cover Egypt. And then from there, your professor is going to probably go on and spend a huge amount of time on the Greeks, an enormous amount of time on the Romans, and then the Middle, e Middle Ages kick in, maybe a lecture on the Middle Ages. They lasted a thousand years, maybe it gets a lecture. And then 
there'll be a lecture or two at the end of the class because the Italians go, hey, I have an idea. Let's do the Renaissance. And that's a really exciting time period. And then the class ends with the, start, with the completion of the Thirty Years' War when Protestants and Catholics slaughter each other wholesale in Europe. Um, the Thirty Years' War is one of my favorite wars because Spain and Sweden fight each other. You know what I mean? They're just, you almost don't need to know anything else about the war. They, they fought three battles in Germany. The Spanish army and the Swedish army met in Germany and they, they beat the crap out of each other. Uh, for the record, the Swedes, while they were in Germany, plundered it. So did the Spanish, of course. <laughs> you're in Germany, come on, of course you're gonna plunder. And they went in Germany. <laughs> stole a bunch of stuff from the city of Würzburg and they took it back to Sweden and a bunch of that ended up in museums. And the city of Würzburg a few years ago sued Sweden to get their stuff back <laughs> from 1648. <laughs> and the European Union went, no, sorry, too bad you lost it. <laughs> I thought, wow. Oh, wow. Why, you ask? Well, because if Stockholm had to return to Würzburg its plundered goods, then Berlin and London would have to re return to Egypt and Iraq its plundered goods. That would have been a catastrophic event for museums in Europe, right? Um, one of my favorite museums on the planet is the Pergamon Museum. It's in Berlin. Uh, if, you, if you love anything to do with the Middle East, it is amazing. You have to go to the Pergamon in Berlin. They have a whole Greek temple that the Germans took out of Turkey stone by stone. They have uh, the gates of Babylon that they took out of Iraq stone by stone. What? And they erected, erected it inside a building specifically constructed to have these two marvels inside them. And in a way, I'm grateful because you can go see it. They're intact, they're preserved. In a way, I'm horrified because these weren't German national treasures. I have actually been to the Temple of Pergamon that's in Berlin, in Turkey. I've been to Pergamon. And there's like the, you know where it is. It's like, wow, so I've been to both. I've seen where it's supposed to be and I've seen where it is. <clears throat> the reason why I'm bringing up the class is because nested in it is a really interesting admission and then a massive omission. The admission is that Western civilization started on the banks of the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Nile, and then they're never talked about again. That's it. Cover it for a week, and then in the next 31 weeks, we're going to talk about how amazing European civilization really was. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it here. Just that it was a good stopping point. I know it's short of the 15, but the next video might be up to 30. But it was just a good good point. That's a cut. Plus, it's a. Uh... It's getting late. In 12 seconds, that would now have ended. I'm just tired. I'm a tired boy. Okay, there's a thanks button. You can uh, donate to the channel. Anything helps. Um, if not, no harm, no foul. It's tough around the world. I'll keep making videos. And uh, you can do me a favor. You can like and subscribe. That's free. And in the meantime, have a good day. Have a good night. Oh. Because this video is going to be so long, it might not, I might just release a, like two a week, just because it's so long. But we'll see. I might change that and disregard everything I just said. Now you can have a good day. Have a good night.